The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. Ben, how are you doing? It's weird seeing you not drawing your morning sloth. Well, I etched one on the back of my iPad, so I'm good. All right, I guess that works. I was reading about this guy up in Canada who only has his right arm, and yet he plays pinball. How does he do that? That sounds crazy. I guess he takes his game, and he drills holes in it and adds buttons and puts them all on one side. I guess, but that sounds difficult if you're trying to play in a bar or a friend's house or something like that. Yeah, people don't usually like you drilling holes into their machines. Maybe we could make something that suction cups onto the game, so it's like an add-on adapter, so we could take it with him. That sounds right up your alley. Yeah, accessibility and pinball. Let's get started. Amazing builds, exclusive mods, cutting edge ideas, electronics, engineering, and more. Every week on Element 14's The Ben Heck Show. Let's figure out how to make a pinball machine that can be played with one hand. Normally you have to push the buttons on either side. So yeah, if you didn't have both your arms, it could be difficult. My first thought is to put both the buttons on one side. So we have them both like this. And I want them to both to be on the same level. That way it doesn't feel awkward. So you know you have one that's raised up because you know you need to push it. But you have the other one, which is already on the game. So I'm thinking we kind of duplicate it. We make a box that fits over the existing button. And one of the buttons just pushes the existing button. The secondary button is actually what will push the button on the other side of the cabinet for you. The reason why we put them on the same level is just so it'll feel more natural. So it'll be like two buttons instead of just one. Here are the steps that I think we're gonna take. First, we'll find the average button position off a bunch of games, how far down and how far in the button is because I'm sure it's different. Different games, different eras, different manufacturers. Then we'll figure out a way to put both buttons on the same side. We'll basically make this module. Then we'll make it a nice box that's easy to install and won't scratch the game. Uh, you know, you could drill buttons into a game, but it's better to make something modular. So I'm thinking suction cups that go into the glass and then the buttons hang down from there and then have adjustments so you move it up and down and left and right. Then finally, we'll duplicate the one button here and mechanize it with a wire to the other side. So there'll be two modules, one on either side, two sides of suction cups, and yeah, that should work. Sounds like a lot of things to do. We better get started. I think these buttons will work out pretty well for the side of the pinball machine, but we need to be able to attach this to a pinball machine. And we wanna do it in a non-destructive manner because pinball machines are expensive, especially if you're out in public. You don't wanna be drilling holes or putting Velcro onto someone's pinball. So I thought, hey, suction cups. I uh, can't do it on the side of the pinball machine because even if you might be able to put in a brand new pinball machine, but any machine with wear is not gonna have a smooth enough surface on the side for the suction to work. But every pinball machine has glass on the top of it. So I thought, you know, using this iPad as an example, we'll put the suction cup here. And then I got these at Menards, they have hooks on them. And the hook actually applies pressure to increase the suction. And this will hang off the side like that. And then since every pinball machine is a little bit different, this will also be able to be raised up and down. We'll have some thumb screws so you can loosen this and go up and down about one inch. And to go forward or backward, obviously you would just move the suction cups. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over to the computer and design a 3D printed hook clasp. And it will also have a mount on it. So the suction cup will go into the frame that holds this and then we'll bolt the hook onto it. So you'll put this in place on your pinball machine and then clamp it down. And then we'll actually have two suction cups so rotation won't affect it. Let's go design on the computer. I'm going to draw these suction cups into the computer so that we can design new clamps for them. We can't use the existing clamps because uh, there's no place to hook anything else onto the suction cup. So we want a clamp that also connects to our side controls. On the screen here, I have the suction cup drawn in a side view. The most important part is this shaft that comes up from the middle. This part actually moves, so when you actually bend the clamp down, the shaft is pulled up, which creates suction at the bottom of the cup. So we want to draw that into the computer and find out its basic measurements and put downward pressure here. I've already designed a little disc that will act as a pressure point for the clamp. So let's go into the Autodesk 123D program. This is a side view of where the clamp's gonna go. The little post we talked about goes right here in the center and the clamp goes around that. To make this into an object, 
we will take this half of it and extrude it in the negative direction, 0.29. Then we'll extrude a cavity inside of it, which is where the shaft will actually fit. And we'll flip it around. Kind of looks like a whistle, doesn't it? 0.29. So the sides of it will be 0.2 and the gap in the middle will be 0.18. And uh, yeah, it has a little bit of uh, slop so that it will fit. All right, so this is what it will look like. Let's 3D print it and see if it works with our suction cups. I 3D printed these clamps. The idea is it pushes down on the suction cup and lifts up on the stalk, which creates suction. So I've got to pop out the pin on these existing hooks and install these new pieces. Oh, well that one came out easily. Strangely enough, the one I did on camera was the easiest to do. Oh, clearly I've already done this. So we put this in and it has a uh, eccentric circle, which means the circle is not on center. Or the circle goes around buying like zoo animals and stuff with its money. <laughs> Look, hello, I am a circle. <laughs> I hear Spade is quite nice this time of year. Oh, why do I go there? Because I'm eccentric. I'm an eccentric circle. And they would have a monocle too. Okay. So those, uh, the posts were four millimeters. So I was able to just use a four millimeter metric screw. All right, this black disc represents the main piece that's gonna hold everything, but the black disc is enough now to test. And what happens is when you push it down like this, it pushes down on the stiff portion and then it lifts up a stalk in the middle creating suction. And again, we did this so that we have some control over how everything goes together. So this black disc will eventually be a part that connects two suction cups together like this, and then the black disc will extend out here and then go down to our button assembly. Now that we have this suction cup and clamp designed, we can design the mount that goes around it. So where this black ring is will actually be a mount and that will attach to the buttons on the side as well. That way our hook and our clamp work as part of our assembly. This is a top-down drawing of what it's gonna look like. These are the suction cups. There's gonna be two of them, so it can't rotate as well. These holes are for the tabs. This portion that extends out here to the side is where the buttons will go. And we have a slot so the buttons can actually go up and down for adjustment purposes, and there'll be uh, set screws to keep them in place. So I'll get the 3D print file. Here's the same thing, vector in a different program. There's a big hole here in the middle to save material. All right, so what's gonna look like with the solids. So we kind of extruded down and most of the details on the bottom, so we'll print this upside down. Suction cups go here and here, and you can see our set screws over here on the left, and we actually have a space inside of it so we can implant these hex nuts inside of the case and then drive a screw through them and the screw will hold onto the hex nut and press against the sliding tab to keep the buttons in place. Then we'll probably have like a twist knob or something on that. Okay, um, hopefully this prints out all right. I guess we'll have to see what happens. Let's print. I mixed scraps of ABS with acetone to create a slurry. I'm going to paint this slurry onto the surface of the printer. This will prevent lifting edges when I make a large print. Here is the resulting frame print. There's a little bit of slurry color left on it, but it printed perfectly flat, so it was worth it. Or had I been thinking, I would have used slurry the same color as my filament. Anyway, um, let's attach this to the suction cups and then try it out on the pinball machine. Suction cups come through here. Also, once I know this works, I'll probably coat it with acetone to smooth it out and increase its strength, but for now, I'm just gonna test it. So it's a suction cup, the lever, and a four millimeter screw for each one of these. And we'll put lock nuts on these screws once we actually assemble it, which we're pretty close to, but test, 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 test. And then afterwards, test more. All right, let's try it on the pinball machine. I'm gonna try to do this one-handed. I did it! What about me? We don't need you anymore. 
<laughs> Felix, why don't you tell us about the Hall Effect sensor you hooked up? All right, so we got the Hall Effect sensor here connected to the Arduino. Whoa, 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 what is a Hall Effect sensor? Well, let me tell you what a Hall Effect sensor is. It's a uh, little IC that detects changes in magnetic field. And it's generally rated in gauze, but we're just going off straight the analog value. Yeah, there's um, usually three connections, power, ground, and analog out. So the proximity of the magnetic field will cause analog out to go from zero volts to whatever voltage you're putting into it. And we have it going into a good old Arduino, and we're sensing it as an analog value, and then we're mapping that to a servo. Mm -hmm. So the reason we went analog is because people with, quote, crazy flipper skills do a lot of funky things. You know, they'll bring the button in and tap it out and, you know, stuff. There's also older games where there'll actually be two leaf switches under a button and pushing it in slightly will make the first flipper go, then pushing the button in all the way will make an upper flipper go because they literally put two switches behind each other. Very old school. So the idea here is to give people as much control as possible. This rig that Felix put together is so we can figure out the latency of it. You know, how accurate is it? So after we do this demonstration here, we're gonna hook up one of these cameras into high speed mode and record it and see how close we get. And if it's not fast enough, we'll use a faster microcontroller. Or if it's not, if that's not fast enough, we may actually just do a direct drive 555 timer using the analog value from the Hall effect sensor to drive a pulse for the stepper motor. But microcontrollers are always easiest because we're lazy, I guess. All right, you ready to give this a try, Felix? Yeah. All right. So we have a 3D printed piece right here that has a rare earth magnet in it. And this is at 0.3 inch distance to the Hall effect sensor, which we'll have to remember when we actually build the real deal of this. And when you push it, you get to about 1 16th of an inch distance or 0 0.0625. Down here, we have a small servo. I use a smaller one or suggested Felix try a smaller one is because I thought we might get a little bit more speed out of it. Smaller servos don't usually have as much range, but the speed's better. And we're mapping this to about 20 degrees of motion. And we tested this by holding it in, then placing this with the button pushed in, hot gluing it in place, and then releasing it. And the button has a concavity on it, so we might be able to just get away with just using one of these standard little shafts. See how it slides in there yeah, just fine? Yeah, pretty nice. All right, let's get some high-speed tests. Let's take a look at that high-speed footage that we shot. Got it here in Adobe Premiere, which is, you know, the official editing program of the Ben Heck Show. It's also what I use personally. Uh, so we got the frame. We see both of the buttons being pushed. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that, copy it, paste it, and put them over each other. And then we'll do something called a garbage mat, which will show us just the switches use eight point garbage mat and just basically isolate the frame so we can see them next to each other. Okay, that looks good. It's not like I'm trying to, you know, remake Titanic here. All right, let's run it. Okay, now when we run it, we can see, you know, a better idea of how close they are. So it looks like at slow speeds, it works pretty well. There's a slow test. It's pretty much one to one. And the faster test, okay, the faster test is where there's a little bit of a lag. So that's something we need to work on. Um, this high speed footage was very useful, as well as our split screen feature. Editing is fun. I actually like doing it, but that's Max's job. We have the suction cup mounts ready to go. So now we're gonna design the side enclosures themselves. In this view here, you can see the primary button and then the secondary button. And then there's a grouping on the screen, which is a bunch of circles. And this is uh, 12 or 13 games that I measured. And what I did was I got the relationship between the lockdown bar and the button for many different brands of pinball machines. And I averaged it out so I could decide the best place to put the button on our replacement module. So the idea is you can slide it up and down, this whole thing will slide up and down, 
And of course you can go to and fro by using the suction cups. And then I drew a side view. So this is the button that presses the cabinet button. And here's our secondary button that goes against the Hall Effect sensor. And they're on the same level, so it'll, it'll feel more natural. I took these drawings into 1, 2, 3D. And then there's also a slot right here for the adjustment potentiometers. Once I had everything drawn, then I created a 3D, which looks like this. So there's countersinks on the outside for the buttons and then standoff posts on the inside for the circuit boards and whatnot, and a hole for the wire. Here's the 3D printed version of our foam core mock-up, ready for parts. The first thing we put in is the normal flipper button. This is the button that's going to press the existing button. So that's pretty simple. I also thought about having a window on this so you could see it, but I think you'll probably be able to line it up pretty well. So we just put that in place with a nut. Then we have our Hall Effect Sensor magnet button. It's gonna go down below. And it's a little different. It's actually cut a little shorter, so there's room for the Hall Effect Sensor. Here's our Hall Effect Sensor. We have it on a piece of perf board. I'm actually gonna put some hot glue on it just to keep it in place. Don't worry, I don't think the hot glue will affect the magnetism. All right. I'm going to use my size four screw tap on the holes so that they won't crack. Probably reinforce them with a little bit of acetone as well. So we just wanna pre-tap them just so they don't, they don't crack when we put the screws in. So there's no electronics on this side, just the Hall Effect sensor and a couple potentiometers that we added, which are going to be your adjustment. So you'll be able to adjust the um, sensitivity and the servo starting position. That's what this little slit is for here. I'm gonna add a nut in there to give it a little bit more distance. This is odd. Well, I th something might have broke inside of it. Oh, this whole thing is coming loose. Ah, all the inside of it came loose. I'm gonna have to repair this print. I fixed my posts using my best friend hot glue. So I've got some threaded aluminum posts in there now. I'm going to attach the Hall Effect sensor and the circuit board to those posts. It also gave me the opportunity to increase the height of the post a little bit because I felt the uh, Hall Effect sensor was a little too close. So now the magnet butts right up against the Hall Effect sensor but doesn't actually touch it. It was a little too close before. All right, now I'm going to attach the adjustment potentiometers and this cable, and then this side will be done. We're using some old USB cable for the connection between the halves. That'll give us a little bit of shielding and uh, it's free. <clears throat> Mostly the free part. I plug this module into our test rig. Let's see if it works. All right, and I can adjust these potentiometers here. This is real handy, so you can just kind of field adjust it. So put this right at the tip of touching the button, and then touch the button. And there's two of them, so you can adjust the sensitivity from two angles. All right, the final step, we have to take all this and build it into one of these for the other side of the cabinet to push the button. Okay, we have the button portion done. Now it's time to build the actuator portion, which is gonna have the servo and actually push the button in. It also needs to contain the microcontroller board and the battery. So I've drawn it up here. 
Basically, we have the servo, which is just like the test rig that Felix and I made. It's in the same relative position to the button. Our development board is going to go there, and our rechargeable battery is going to go there. Give you a side view so you can see how the servo pushes the button. Hopefully, this all works. And here's the top view in relation. So we also have to make a mirrored copy of the suction cup mount, too. Okay, so here is the line drawing in 123D, and then we can turn on the solids so you can see how that's going to look. This one's not as curvy as the other one because there's more stuff that has to go in it. We need to actually have a battery pack that fits in it. But you can see where the servo is going to mount on those posts right there. And there's a big hole there for a window. That's so you can look in and see how the servo is actually pushing against the button to make sure it's lined up correctly. And there's a hole on the side for the power switch and a power indicator LED. Okay, we'll start printing this, and I'll also make some adjustment knobs so we can attach the sliding portion to the suction cup mount. I reinforced the inside of this 3D printed case with super glue, and I'm clamping it shut. But while it cures, I can start putting parts in it. So we're going to have the Microcontroller here, the window here, servo goes here, and the battery goes to the bottom. Now I'm gonna start assembling it, that's on me. Next I'm going to install the servo. It's gonna be a little tricky, don't have very good angles to get at the screws, but I think I can do it. So this is going to sit on the machine like this, and the button's here, so the servo's going to push into it. So I'm basically, it's like this. I guess I can pull this arm off. So when the time comes, I'll be able to uh, put that screw in once I have it where I want it. I'm going to shorten this wire and then probably add the battery pack in pretty soon. Ohio hot glue. I'm hoping the battery helps weigh this down so when the servo pushes against the button, it doesn't just push the whole thing out, it actually pushes the button in. I'm going to attach the 5 volt uh, regulator directly to the board so we can take the 7.4 volts from the battery and drop it down. Okay, so there we go. There's the large capacitor, the servo, the regulator, the indicator LED, the power switch, and the battery. Okay, we can finish putting the mechanical touches on this and test it out on a game. Let's finish this up. I have a block here that will slide into the suction cup mount. I'm gonna glue that in place. So this slides into the block here and it allows you to move it up and down. You can move this one up and down as well. To hold it in place, I have these I have hex head screws, size six, and I 3D printed a plastic shaft around them to work as a thumb knob. So here's how these are gonna work. You thread them into place, and there's captive nuts that hold them tight. Otherwise, it would just strip away the plastic. So these go on the game like this, and then this can go up and down based off where the button actually is, because as I mentioned, it changes from game to game. So then you can just hand tighten these when you have it where you want it. Ta-da! I guess we're ready to install this on a game. The two halves are complete. I'm going to install them onto this America's Most Haunted game that I designed because it's out here in the open and easy to film. When I measured a bunch of games to find the uh, common ground, so to speak, I also measured our game, America's Most Haunted. Tighten the knobs, then activate the suction cups. It's like Robo Octopus. All right, that side's ready. Let's do the other side. So there's a window here so we can see that the servo is hitting the button. You can also kind of reach in there and feel that it is. That one seems pretty good. It's locking in place. You'll notice this kind of has a uh, L shape to it. It comes out and then down from the suction cups. That is so you miss the lockdown bar, which every pinball machine has. All right, let's just... See if this is on the button. The servo's been aligned, so now it's time to play some pinball with one hand tied behind my back. Spirit guide, guide us. 
Oh good, haunted bar is lit. Yeah, yeah, one-handed shot. A ghost minion! There we go. Hey, that worked pretty well. I actually defeated a couple ghost bosses on America's Most Haunted. Tonight, on America's Most Haunted. Are ghosts real? Find out next week. In today's episode, our challenge was to enable a person to play pinball with a single hand. We accomplished this with suction cup mounted 3D printed enclosures and digitally controlled button duplicators. I am fairly happy with the outcome. It does indeed work and the devices look cool. There is about 83 milliseconds of lag which we could probably remove with a discrete logic solution or better gearing on the motor. What would I have done differently? Well, this project took a lot of 3D printing and we spent far more time designing and building the enclosures than we did making the circuit itself. It was a bit of a crunch doing all this in four days, but we made it happen. How did you like our approach to solving this problem? Would you have done anything differently? Let us know on the Element 14 community. That's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, we'll be tackling a game console people have wanted me to hack for years, the Sega Dreamcast. We'll see you then. Look, the holiday roast is done. <laughs> that used to be my hat. <laughs> now it's your hat. It's on you. <laughs> Hello, Peter Pan. You don't remember me, do you? I'm Dustin Hoffman. The two halves of the thing we don't have a name for. <laughs> Even though I'm completely sick of making pinball machines, I kind of maybe might want to make another one someday. Actually, maybe that's not a good way to put it. Hey, Ben Heck here for the Mighty Suction Cup. Just put it onto your iPad, clamp it over, and it picks it right up. It can hold over 9,000 pounds. <laughs> <laughs>I was just thinking about Samurai Cop. The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. <laughs>